Okay, here we go. Uh, let's get the treadmill on. Day four, back on the Camino. It is Sunday afternoon, 6th of February. It's the first time I haven't got up early to do it. It's not Sunday, it's Saturday. So I didn't have to get up early because I didn't have work today. And uh, I did contemplate it, you'd be glad to know. Uh, good at contemplation, not so good at putting things into action. But here I am. Um, still on lockdown. I had a strange experience yesterday afternoon, actually. Somebody called to my house, whom I hadn't seen, who I hadn't seen in a long time, and um, he kind of wasn't well. He's off his meds, and uh, it was... Uh, just a little tricky and uh, came back I actually moved my car he said he was going to come back and move my car so it looked like it wasn't in it's not something I like doing but it was appropriate I think he came back he was hanging outside my house last night and, and this morning apparently but he's gone into town now I hope uh, it's just one of those things that's going to come to a head and hopefully work out for the best and I just send out lots of love there and uh, you can't always get involved in these things so um, put me a little off kilter maybe this morning as well although no I was just lazy this morning that's the main reason I didn't get up and do this early that's nice though it's nice to get up early to do this on a work day and then Sure, on a weekend sleep in, but it's nice to get up on the treadmill again and start uh, doing the Camino. Uh, I've turned it down a lot. Let me just listen to the sound. The sky looks quite nice there. And uh, it's uh, just a few white clouds. As I said, on Ireland, that would be considered a good day. Might be a bit cold up there because you're up high. Um, high up on the Pyrenees. So, the clicking of the sticks, don't know how that's affecting people. Uh, I tried to keep it low on the mix. So, uh, but it's nice to hear a bit of it, I think. It's, it's certainly a sound of the Camino. What are we looking at here? Okay, a cross. So this is a monument. I can't actually read it there, but it's to somebody who uh, probably passed away on the Camino. God rest their soul. It's funny, I said before, I don't find that morbid. Um, people die everywhere. And when you see it on the Camino, it just, you know, it reminds you of that. So I managed not to talk about death yesterday, and uh, I'm already talking about it now. But actually, one of the mounds of stones he passed yesterday, that BK passed, uh, I, I look, when I looked at it when I, um, afterwards on the big screen, I could see it looked like it was a memorial to someone who, who uh, didn't make it. As I said, there's worse places to go. Look at this, isn't it lovely? Beautiful. So peaceful. Another thing I missed out on yesterday, early on BK passed someone on the way and I thought he said, hi Anya or something. And I realized later, I'm pretty sure what he said was Anyon, which is Korean for hi. I think he said Anyon and then the person's name. And uh, I was kind of annoyed that I missed the opportunity to show off my linguistic knowledge yesterday. I'm sort of doing it now, it's not the same though, is it? You're thinking he probably just Googled that. But actually, I uh, had a Korean friend in... Um... Oh, I want to carry my phone. This always happens, one second. I want to carry my phone to count the steps. I also have a smartwatch I was going to carry, but no, the phone is enough. Um, I'm, but even though I'm going by the by the treadmill, so where were we? When I studied in Russia, I had a friend 
Britain from Korea. Her name is Oh Han Jong. I don't know what happened to her since then. I hope she's still around somewhere. If you're listening, Oh, hi. We call her Oh, but my understanding is that that's her surname, right? Just gonna adjust the mic here one sec. Okay. Yeah, my understanding is that O would be her surname, like you know the way Kim would be a first name, a surname in Korean. The name come, the surname comes first. So anyway, O Han Jong, but we all called her O. And the Korean words I learned were Anyong, which is hi. It's kind of a casual version. There's a longer version of it. That's more like hello. But Anyong is also goodbye, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, the other one is Gomsa Hamnida, thank you. Um, Oma, I think is mother, and Opa is father. That's about all I know. But O, oh, as we called her, her mother was visiting Moscow at the time. So uh, I remember we'd phone. Oh, I remember having a conversation with her mother. Her mother spoke no Russian and no English, and I had but four words of oh, this is some Korean being spoken right now I think hope you're not expecting me to translate he's telling a joke I can tell you that much anyway where was I so yeah I phone oh I'm listening into them as if I have some hope of understanding what they're saying. Must be a few Koreans on the trail. I met a few as well on the way, I suppose. South Koreans, needless to say. Um, I think there's quite a high Catholic population there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So, so, oh, I'd phone her mother. Her mother would answer the phone. I would go, ah, Anyon. She would say Anyon. I would say, ah, James, meaning I'm James. She would say, ah, James. And I would say, oh, meaning is O there? And she would say, oh, no. Translation, O oh, is not here. Then I would say, ah, come Hamnida. And Anyon. She would say, Anyon. I would hang up. Amazing, you know, with those few words, how one was able to have a conversation. So, uh, hopefully BK is doing okay here. It's a nice portion. I was walking with that Irish woman, uh, Ashley, at this point. I just remember this being a point of release and relief. And was it raining? I don't, it was raining most of that day, but... It just felt nice up there. Maybe it was a little cold, I don't know, but it was just nice that it wasn't a hill. Then there's a big downhill coming. Uh, all the way down to Roncevallas, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. So, uh, what else did I want to clear up? Okay, so we cleared up Agnon, was what he was saying, which is high and that he passed a memorial. I have some notes here, I might look at them. Hold on a sec there. Things to talk about. I was thinking more about that um, Anthony Hopkins quote. That seems to be the theme that keeps coming up. What was the end of it again? I'm not, um, I expect nothing and accept everything. But the reason I got on a whole Anthony Hopkins sort of buzz, a friend of mine sent me uh, on YouTube a link to Anthony Hopkins, or Tony Hopkins as they call them here, doing a talk at an open AA meeting and uh, in somewhere in Los Angeles or in California. And um, I think he's done a couple. There was another I came across in Florida, but definitely the LA one was better, I thought. And um, really glad he sent me that. It was amazing. I, and I'm pretty sure he it was an open meeting and 
I'm pretty sure he knew it was being recorded and I don't think it would be out there without his permission. Um, but it really, a lot of that 12 step stuff is, I quite like it. I think a lot of people can benefit from it. And a lot of what he was talking about, even though, you know, I, I'm not an alcoholic, but I could relate to just talking about feeling like an outsider a lot and feeling inadequate. And I think lots of people feel that in different ways. Sometimes I think some people are, okay, stronger, less, yeah, maybe less sensitive. I don't mean that in a bad way. Just stronger, more able for life. And, um, and maybe more able to play the game a bit. And I really don't mean any of that as condescension because part of life is playing a game. I mean, just the regular nine to five stuff and, you know, being a contributing member of society and all that. And to be honest, like, you need a certain majority of people to be able to play the game or society falls apart, perhaps. Almost definitely. I don't think that's perhaps a situation. And society also needs to be helped to be able to help people who find it harder to cope. And also ideally needs to help people to help themselves. There's a balance to be struck there. And where am I going with this? Oh yeah, the Tony Hopkins talk was great though. But he talked oh, more conversation here. He must, BK must be walking with a group of Koreans. Oh, what's he looking at? I missed that. My eyes were closed again. It's really helpful. Um, where was I? The talk, Tony Hopkins. I've totally lost my train of thought, forgive me. Give me a second there. Yeah, I like that 12 step st stuff though. I think it's helpful. Yeah, cool. And, um, uh, I'm getting distracted by the conversation. Please be Kay, can't you see I'm speaking? <laughs> so, um, he was talking about, there's one bit where he's talking about after years of drinking and just, not, you know, even though he had career success and everything, he was miserable and he finally came to AA, met these AA people and, oh, what are they looking at? And, um, Sorry, BK has stopped. Some other people coming towards him. Um, nothing, nothing dramatic. Going on. Oh, hold on, one of them's got a gun. No, I'm just, I'm just saying that for the people who are listening to this rather than watching it, trying to liven it up. That's a lot of work. I'd have to put in gunshot sounds and everything. I just, uh, I do enough editing for my day job. <laughs> so I guess they're in a group together. But yeah, I did notice that on the Camino, people who walked in groups. I walked on my own. Would meet people along the way, walk with them, then split up. Yeah. But quite a few people I met in groups would split up during the day because they walked at different paces and it's nice to be on your own or meet different people and then they would get together in the evening. I think if I did it with a group, that's the way to do it. Even for a couple, I don't know if many couples split up. But really it depends on the pace, doesn't it? But um, we all have different paces. So Tony Hopkins was talking about not fitting in. So at the end, when he finally, just things really spiraled. And he ended up, ended up meeting some AA people and he thought, oh God, are these happy, clappy Christians or whatever. And, he wasn't sure, but one of them said, welcome home. And he just started crying. And then a man came to his house to bring him to a meeting the next day. And I think he was talking to a couple of AA men and he said, um, you know, I feel inadequate. And one of them said, well, maybe you are inadequate. And he said, it was such a relief. And I kind of get that. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I, I just can't stand here <laughs> on my treadmill and say I am completely adequate. And uh, 
I find that a relief to acknowledge that. And for me, the idea of asking some sort of higher power, something outside of me that I can't comprehend for help, works. Maybe that's just another life hack, I don't know. It works for me though, um, when I let it. And I, I, as I was saying the other day, this whole idea of life hacks and of, I don't know, a lot of people putting forward this image that we can all do anything, you know, is maybe misleading. So, and maybe trying to, it's all trying to avoid the fact of our, our immortality. Sorry, no death tomorrow, okay? That's every second day. So, um, I find I find that useful, and it doesn't mean that you give up. You just acknowledge I can't do everything. I do my best. Try not to be an asshole along the way. I think a little bit of ambition is good. I think too much ambition is bad. Too little could be bad. I don't know. I don't know. I like a little bit that makes me want to write my book, makes me want to do this, do the Camino, redo the Camino. But I'm not doing it as some big, I'm not trying to do it faster than anyone. I'm genuinely trying not to be too much of a know it all or a wise guy. I tend to crack jokes here and there that I think are funny, but uh, I certainly don't take myself for stand-up comedian but yeah the what's that thing again I am I am inadequate and today it made me think of something else so I did this course some years ago in Sussex in England called the Hoffman process which was all about processing family stuff I think everybody has family stuff going back generations issues you know and yeah it helped me a lot be honest. Not really in touch with anyone except maybe one or two people from that since then. That tends to happen with these things, but I found it really useful. I found it really good. And I remember when I left after the course, I kind of did everything as much by the book as possible. They suggested that you go somewhere quiet for two days after the course rather than, so the course was about a week, and rather than going straight back to your life they suggested going somewhere quiet. So I had previous to this spent time in um, a Benedictine monastery in Ireland called Glenstall Abbey, where I would go sometimes for a few days to um, chill out. And I'd go to the liturgies, as they call them, where the monks would chant. And I would eat in silence with the monks, along with other guests. And um, I always found it really, peaceful, really deep, and felt great after. But I also felt there was some mystery that the monks were tuned into. I mean, this is the Christian mystery as they profess it, that they really seem real when I was there. And of course, it's to argue it uh, intellectually is impossible. So if it comes to a logical argument about it, I just, I would concede defeat straight away. I mean, if there is such a thing as God, let's just imagine there is. It seems completely appropriate for me to say that the logical brain could never comprehend such a thing. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And the right brain can conceive of this. But once you put it into words, actually a quote my friend Declan sent me the other night, something from I think St. Augustine is saying, you know, if you can understand it, it's not God. I think that's, I'd buy that for a dollar. But back to the, so after the Hoffman course, I remembered that there's also a Benedictine monastery in, um, and I said, I think it's in Sussex, which is where I did the course. And sure enough, I looked it up, it's in um, Sussex, close to Gatwick Airport. So I booked to stay there for two or three days. Uh, oh, got a funny story from there, too. Well, I think it's funny. 
but I remember going in there and anyone who's done any of these quote life-changing courses oh I have another good story just from there as well coming up stay tuned I got a mystical story and a funny story so hopefully one of them will grab you um, so I go there and I check in got a simple room and the room I had connected to the church you could go in there any time of day or night and I was familiar with this building because BBC 4 which used to be called something else like BBC Choice one of the you know, d digital stations in its first years was called something else but they made a documentary called The Monastery where they sent I think it was six men to stay at Worth Abbey that's the monastery in Sussex in England. They sent them there and um, I mean it was a type of reality TV but the monks I think were, it was one of the monks in Glenstall who told me about it the first time I stayed in Glenstall. He said the, the Worth Abbey monks were very clear at BBC. They want, I think they wanted editorial control as in, well they didn't really want it to be, I think it was they didn't want it to be over engineered and it really wasn't and one of them Tony one of the guys in the documentary you'll find it on YouTube actually the monastery um, there's another documentary called the monastery that's great too about about a nun trying to build a monastery in the property of this rich man I think it was in this rich old man in Sweden fascinating documentary but anyway the other one is a four part I think for BBC or six part I think it was for six men staying in the monastery and Tony went on a really interesting journey where he had what he would call a religious experience or a mystical experience sort of live on camera and it was um, I found it quite mind-blowing and um, the interesting thing was that Tony was the one guy who had no baggage like one of them was training to be an Anglican priest, another was sort of loyalist from Northern Ireland, sort of, I guess, hardcore, you know, Presbyterian, or, you know, fundamentalist um, religious person. They all had different baggage, but Tony had no religious baggage at all. And yet he, I think, from my opinion, and most people say, he had the most powerful journey which was amazing to watch, I recommend it. So I'm in Worth Abbey anyway after doing the Hoffman process. And I um, went into the church, I think late at night. I was on my own in there and there was a little kind of, um, not a vestibule, a little, I don't know, room within a room behind the altar. And the Bible was open or the, the book they used for mass, which is sections from the Bible. And it was open on this phrase, which as an Irish Catholic I would have heard lots of times. So it's part of the Mass. Um, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you. They've actually, the newer version of that is, Lord, I'm not worthy to enter under your roof. But either way, I am not worthy. And I remember reading that after doing the Hoffman course. And just my reaction was, but I am worthy. And... Uh, that was an interesting reaction and there's a truth to that as well and there's definitely a lot of negativity that came with the church and I do wonder that a lot of the men who interpreted these messages over the years and they would have been all men I think um, brought their own maybe their own negativity and all and their own self-hatred to it there was certainly a negative message transmitted in Ireland sort of Irish Victorian Catholicism pretty harsh a lot of bad things happened a lot of bad things that still haven't been fully dealt with but just yesterday I had another thought about it and your words are important words are powerful they're not everything some people think words are reality they're not they point to reality some people can really beat the crap out of you with arguments because they can arrange the words really well in a certain order, like a chess game, to defeat you. But 
There's more to life than words. And when you talk about mystery, you start to get beyond words. And I was thinking just yesterday um, about, Lord, I'm not worthy. But then this idea, Anthony Hopkins saying, I'm inadequate. So remember all these words, you know, the Bible was written in different languages. Was it written in Aramaic? I don't know, was that even a written language? Was some of it written in Greek or Latin? I, okay, hands up, I don't know. I, I think it was written in different languages. The point is, by the time it arrives to us, like, like let's say, whatever version, King James or the Catholic version, the Douay, I think they call it, it has gone through different translations and also different politics and interference from people in power. So, gone through a lot of iterations. For instance, I don't think there's any message in it about homosexuality being an abomination. And I, I, my understanding is that, that that either there's no mention at all or that abomination is a mistranslation. I don't think there's any mention of hell either. Um, so definitely a lot of politics and ideology gets attached along the way. Anthony de Mello, there is a great guy. I'm totally going off on a tangent here, but he talked about, he had a parable about a man who comes to a prehistoric society, teaches them how to light a fire, and the elders are jealous of this man and his powers, so they kill him. But they get his implements that he used to make the fire, and they make a trophy out of them for the people to worship. And then the people worship the implements of the fire, but they have no fire in their lives. I think that's a great analogy for people getting the message of Christianity, even other messages, Buddhism and different things, and taking the fire out of it and making it about control. But I want to get back to, when I'm talking about words, just the insight I had today was, imagine if instead of, Lord, I'm not worthy, it was, Lord, I am inadequate. Or, let's change that a little bit more, universe, I am inadequate. Great mystery, I am inadequate. That, that's a more interesting way of looking at it. And that I go, that I like. I am inadequate. It doesn't mean I'm 100% inadequate. But just, I can't solve everything. And I will die, and life is, can be overwhelming to me at times, and can be beautiful at times. But the pressure, and I do think it's a message we get a lot today, to be superhuman is, it's a lot of pressure. And you know, I was talking yesterday about celebrities talking about depression, and I may have sounded cynical about it. I was trying to figure out what I think about it myself. And personally, I think it's great that by saying that they are saying I am inadequate, that actually is a good thing. I think maybe the part that I struggle with is just the way uh, media co-ops just sort of puts that all into a package together and even makes their depression into a sort of celebrity thing, if that makes sense. But it can't be bad. It can't be bad that they are acknowledging their inadequacy or their frailty. And this is one thing that, um, there's a lot of positive thinking philosophies out there that refuse to acknowledge human frailty. And I know someone who's quite sick right now, who would have bought into a lot of that, and I hope she gets the help she needs possibly this person is listening to the wrong people and I remember saying to this person once I'm tired and she said you're not tired you must not say that you know the conversation between the body and the mind it's a two-way conversation and yes if my mind keeps telling my body I'm tired when I'm not I can just feel tired all the time but you know sometimes the mind has to listen to the body too of course it's a two-way thing my body tells me I'm tired. My mind is still racing. 
And if my mind listens to my body, it realizes, no, I need to just relax, go to bed, switch off CNN or whatever, Netflix. Just take some time to relax. So that was my insight, though. Let's imagine instead of Lord, I'm not worthy, Lord, or universe, I am not adequate. Maybe people don't want to hear that. Maybe some people are fully adequate. How, who am I to say? But uh, I don't feel 100% adequate, and uh, nor does Tony Hopkins. <laughs> Ooh, name drop. <laughs> yeah. See, I could fantasize now about meeting Tony Hopkins and saying, saying yeah, man, I relate. But uh, I won't. I won't do that. I did enough of that when I was younger. The book I'm writing is about a fantasist. That's a part of my personality. So another part of my personality is a realist. That's the part that's going to write the book. So it's a question of balance. Without being a fantasist, maybe I wouldn't have been creative. But without being a bit of a realist, you know, I won't get the book done. So here's, okay, I have two stories. How are we doing time-wise? 32 minutes in, okay. I'd say most of the stories now today are gonna to relate to my first day in Worth Abbey, in uh, just outside Crawley in uh, Sussex. And um, so when I first arrived, just fresh out of Hoffman process. I guess I'm a little high, a little ungrounded after, that's kind of normal. I got a taxi and the guy either insisted on not charging me anything or giving me a cut rate and I was sort of fighting with him about it and then I thought, well, I'll, I'll accept it. It was like if anyone has seen Father Ted, the scene where Mrs. Doyle and her friend are fighting over who will buy the cup of tea. It could have turned into that. And one thing that's actually been hard for me to learn is to accept when people to give you things. I find, I think I find it easier to give than receive. I'm sure some of my friends will beg to differ, but that's how I see it. Um, I doubt I'm alone in that. There's something about receiving help, isn't there, that can make you feel really vulnerable. Um, Anyway, I accepted that as a nice moment. And it was just one of those days, you know, when you just you feel like you're in the zone and things flow and it's beautiful. And I think some people are in the zone more often than most of us. Um, so I arrive and we're waiting for the abbot to welcome us to the abbey. And there's a Scottish guy. I'm going to do the accent this time, damn it. I'm going to do the accent and I'm going to murder him. So, he's, um, he was working in the city in London, and he's out there to stay in the monastery. So he mentioned that, yeah, I'm, uh, but I won't do the accent just yet, but I, there's one line I'll probably have to use the accent for, but he's telling me he's working in the city. So I'm just off this course, and I was told at the end of the course, we were told, you know, just don't go out preaching to everybody, but, you know, I'm like, well, I, I have to preach to this guy, because I... As soon as he said he works in the city, I just thought, you know, he's a lost soul and looking for meaning and I'm going to, I'm going to spread the word and heal him, you know, help this poor gentleman. So, uh, the abbot welcomes us in or whatever. I think I mentioned briefly I'd been on this Hoffman course or whatever. Anyway, I think he said, do you want to talk after dinner? So we go and we have dinner, supper in silence with the monks. It's really nice eating in silence, not having to make small talk. I like that. But, um, so I go to the library with them afterwards, or there's a visitor's room or guest room, and we have a chat. So I'm telling him all about Hoffman. And anyway, he starts kind of preaching religion to me, and I realized, well, actually, he wasn't quite, I mean, a lost boy from the city. He was pretty much kind of doctrinaire Catholic and he started preaching to me and I can't remember what I was saying to him but he started saying well you know the world was built in seven days kind of reminded me of um, Ian Paisley the, uh, from who 
famous kind of hardline Presbyterian minister from Northern Ireland, and uh, who mellowed a bit in older age. But um, uh, I just thought it was funny that I thought I could help this guy, and he was like one of these people who probably feels he doesn't need any help. And I guess he was trying to rescue me, maybe from the fires of hell or something. It was, but anyway, we end up. Here's me announcing this as a funny story, and now I'm telling it and going, hmm. See, I make, as I said, things are funny in my head. I don't have the stand-up comedian's kind of delivery, but I'll keep going. So he, uh, on the Sunday, no, at lunchtime, the monks welcome you in to have coffee with them. And then on the Sunday, you eat at the same table as monks and you talk, which they don't do in Glenstall, they do it in Worth Abbey. I like that a lot. So we got chatting to them anyway, and I was talking to one of the monks about the Bible and religion and things, and he's saying, oh, well, you know, the Old Testament, don't know, it's just, a, it's an allegory, really, blah, blah, blah. And I could just feel the Scottish gentleman beside me, I could feel his ears burning. And so the monk is here, kind of been really kind of liberal in his um, interpretation of it all. And, and I just said, well, I think this guy here might beg to differ. So my Scottish friend, <laughs> So it's preaching to the monk. Well, you know that the church's teaching is that the world was built in seven days. Uh, excuse the accent. Apologies to Scottish people and, and everybody. Anyway, I just found it. I was just sitting there smiling to myself. But it's just funny that I was on my high horse thinking I could preach to this guy and help him. And of course, he's thinking he could preach to me and help me, and that, that's... Most people, most of us are going through life like that, you know. I mean, I've dabbled in all sorts of things, including shamanism. And, uh, I don't know, I don't think a shaman is going to help my friend, the Scottish guy, my acquaintance, maybe he could. I don't think he can help the shaman. Of course, I like to think of myself as this open-minded in-between guy, but I'll tell you a story someday about the time I went on a vision quest, shamanic vision quest. Didn't complete it, but I actually chose, I felt the stronger thing for me was to say, no, this isn't my path. And that was important for me. Sorry, I, when I close my eyes, I think I go off mic. Uh, 22 minutes left. going to tell you, actually, I'm going to, Take off um, item of clothing. <laughs> Cue striptease music. Okay. So, uh, gonna take some water as well. Stay tuned, mystical experience coming up. A friend of mine told me when I mentioned this, I mean, I've had a few mystical experiences, for want of a better word. Oh, there's our yellow arrow, is it? Yeah, so we're going the right way. That's good. There's another one. Good, we're going the right way. Good man, BK, I'll let you lead the way. I'll just follow. Um, I've had a few, only a handful that I could really count. One was my cat, Bobby, which I told you, arriving on the day I wished for a kitten. I, would, I experienced that as a mystical experience, obviously. Someone else can say, and would say, uh, and it's, a point that statistically a certain amount of these things coincidences will happen in all our lives is this a little church coming up it's a little hut um just gonna wait now I, I go off on my tangents which is fair enough because a lot of the time the scenery doesn't change but when i come to something like this and i'm sure bk is going to stop oh my god bk turn back Okay, well, just as well, I would have gone in. I mean, it was open, okay. Anyway, where was I? So I'm staying at mystical experiences. Bobby McCat was one, here's the other one. And my friend Kevin said to me when I told him I had a mystical experience in this place, he said, oh, don't tell me, you know, you should keep these things to yourself. And, I don't know, I've shared it a few times. I like, to sh I like to share the story about Bobby, my cat. And I do like to share this one because some people find it interesting. Some people think it's all Codswallop. That's fair enough, but 
here it goes anyway. Um, so I was staying in Worth Abbey uh, after my failure to convert the Scottish guy to my way of thinking. I was out for a walk in the woods the next day. I was still reliving a lot of the exercises I did on the Hoffman process and sort of processing it all. And I really had let go of a lot of baggage on that course. And that's a few years ago. I can still say to this day, you know, I have let go of a lot of it. Not all of it, a lot though. It's still inadequate, of course. <laughs> um, and on a tantra course I did, I let go of a lot of stuff and there was a lot of healing. I'm not fixed, and I think this idea of being fixed, no, nah, it's a nice idea. We'd all like it, but it's probably an illusion. Maybe not, I'll let you know if I'm fixed. Maybe by the end of this Camino I'll be fixed. I'm certainly uh, open to the idea. So, just about 20 minutes left. So, uh, yeah, mystical experience in Worth Abbey. So I'm walking in the woods, and I'm really definitely that day in the zone, just so relaxed. You know, I'd switched off my phone for a week, which is part of the course, handed my phone over, in fact. Didn't read newspapers, did this intense work. Let go of a lot of anger, let in a certain amount of compassion. I suspect I probably let go of more anger than the amount of compassion I let in. Or maybe, maybe not, maybe the two are equal. I don't know, maybe the, as much anger you let go allows the same amount of compassion to come in. You can't measure these things scientifically, that's for sure, but I felt really good. I'm walking in the forest and um, I got spooked in one point in the forest. Forests sometimes spook me, you know, and I just wanted to get away from that area. But I was carrying a stick that I found a large branch and I was carrying it like a kind of some figure from the Bible or something, Moses or something. I mean, if someone saw me, they may have thought I was a madman. I certainly wasn't the kind of your typical description of a sane man, but I don't know. Do I really want to be that? 100% sane if there is such a thing? What is that? I don't know. Anyway, here I am walking like Moses, Moses with my stick. And I get lost in the forest and I come to a clearing in the forest. Just a sort of an opening and there was a patch with no trees and it's kind of square, rectangular patch and there was a a hut in the distance and it just I had a sense of deja vu it reminded me of it felt like something I'd seen in a dream and I'm standing there holding the big branch and I realize it looked like something from a Tarkovsky film or something and there's a man walking towards me I didn't see him at first and then I see this man walking towards me and he stops and we get talking and it turned out his name is Jim. My namesake, I'm James. Some people call me Jimmy. So he's Jim from somewhere originally up north. I get these places mixed up in, in England. Northumberland or Northamptonshire, or, and I'm pretty sure they are miles apart. He's a retired um, policeman living in uh, Crawley or nearby, near Worth Abbey. And it turned out he was working, he worked with the monks as a, there's a position where you can be, a, oh, what do they call it? It's like a lay member. And it's not an abbot, the abbot is the head. It doesn't matter, it's some role. And he's an Anglican, but he said, that's fine, it doesn't matter. And he said, I think you could even be an atheist and perform this role. It will come back to me, whatever the name is. So, but we talked a bit about the Hoffman process and about, parental issues and all that kind of stuff, swapped stories. And uh, I said to him, so yeah, when I told him about the process though, he said, oh yeah, you know, when I saw you, he said, I thought you were carrying a lantern because I was carrying this stick. And he thought initially there was a lantern attached to it. Um, because he said my face was lit up with a yellow orange glow. Now, the funny thing is, um, on the course when we did 
we did one of these things, uh, uh, visualization things. I have to be clear, the course is a lot more than just that. A lot of it's quite practical as well. But there was a visualization where we imagined our body full of light. And I take note of the color. And I'm not normally great at those things. But I did remember clearly having sensed that the color was a yellow orange. And, and then when he, I didn't tell him that, but he said, yeah, I thought your face was lit up. He specifically said with the yellow orange glow. And then I told him about, well, on the course, um, that's exactly the color I imagined my body being filled with. And I said to him before he went, I said, you know, I feel like one part of me thinks I should take a picture of you as a memento, which is what we all do nowadays. We have our phones there nearby with a camera on it. And I said, and another part thinks I should just let the mystery be. And he th said, yes, I think you should just let the mystery be. And he walked off. And that for me felt like a mystical moment. But it's one of these things where you kind of have to be there as well. It's not just what happened or what I saw, it's what I felt. And of course, that's the level at which you can debunk all this stuff and say it's all just chemicals in our head. I love the way I'm always filling in with the alternate point of view. That's partly because my way of coping with strong, dominant voices in life has, to, has been to be the kind of diplomat and the person in the middle. And I'm learning more now to be myself. But I think I'll always hopefully be a little flexible. But I, at some stage, I think I need to stop chiming in with the alternate point of view sort of making apologies for myself. I'm kind of worn out doing that. Um, no matter what you do in life, certain people will get angry anyway. Uh, Buen Camino, which is overtaking two walkers there. Um, so that was that. The next day I went to, so I followed, went to all the liturgies of the monks chant, and I went to the Sunday Mass. And I remember, during the, you know, the Eucharist, the communion bit, they're playing the, um, no, they were doing the Peace Be With You bit, I think, and the organ was playing. Any Catholic would know that bit, the Peace Be With You, and you shake hands, and the organ was playing, and Jim, the man I'd met, I didn't see him, but he had been across the way from me, and he came over to me, and the organ was still playing, and he came over, and he shook my hand, sort of held, shook my hand with his right hand, and held it with the left hand, you know that method and said, peace be with you, James. And I actually, out of context, didn't recognize him until he said my name. And it just, it felt like a continuation of the, the mystical moment. And I, actually, I'm not gonna butt in with the counteraction to that. Someone can, if you wanna leave your comments in the comment column. <laughs> Haven't got any so far. I have ticked the box where he, I can vet comments because if there's anything ugly or angry, um, yeah, I don't really want to engage with that. At the moment, uh, getting comments has not been a problem. <laughs> and maybe it will continue that way. That's okay. So how are we doing on time? Oh, no, still 11 minutes left. Ish. 11 or 12, I'm gonna take some water here. I thought um, those two stories would take me to the end. I was sort of, yeah, I got this one nailed, but they haven't. Um, but talking about people having cameras at the ready the whole time, I was at the uh, Galway Arts Festival a couple of years ago, and um, there was an exhibition by an artist, I think he's from New Zealand, I'm not sure, but he makes, um, Buen Camino, Buen Camino. More people passing by. Why are they going the other way? Interesting. Buen Camino. Anyway, um, I, uh, where was I? Cameras. So I was at the uh, an art exhibition. This guy, he makes models of human bodies, human forms, naked. And he makes them three quarters size, and I, there's some reason for that. I think it makes it more kind of strange or something. And they're in different positions, but they're all kind of positions of vulnerability. And I found it really profoundly touching. 
anyone listening to me probably thinks I'm profoundly touched all the time, and certainly I'm. But that really, a lot of art leaves me cold. I'm like, oh, you know, especially in galleries and things. I was in like, what's it, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, twice. One time hungover, another time in a different condition. Couldn't really relate to, um, to it either time. But, well, I was young and doing silly things as well. But every so often something really hits me and this hit me. But one thing that did bug me, there's really no point in dwelling on these things too much because you can just make yourself angry, but everybody was allowed to take pictures in there. So you're trying to experience this art. Everybody's sticking their iPhones and their Android phones, their tablets in front of you. And I mean, I feel the ruining the experience themselves. If you want to see pictures of it, you can get really high quality photographs of this art online. And I couldn't understand. It seems so obvious to me that they should ban photography in there. Because I had people in there to keep you, tell you to shut your mouth and keep quiet. Great, but I really think they should insist and it's better for everybody that you don't take your camera in that you experience it but of course I had to I was letting my irritation about that ruin my experience of it so I did have to have to kind of try and keep that in check like the way I am with the cyclists and the Camino you can let that ruin the whole thing for you and it's only your own peace that's at stake there Thus endeth the sermon on cameras and bicycles. Now I've eight minutes left and I feel like I'll put on the fan. Let's put the fan on. Don't know where my cats are. Bobby was on the couch earlier. That's a few things up on my bed. They have a great life. Imagine getting them on the Camino, not a hope. Mind you, they do their own little Camino every night. Anyway. Um, that fan is making a weird noise. I hope it doesn't interfere too much with the sound. So, I look at my notes here. The only notes I have are more Mary O'Hara quotes. I'll leave that for the moment. Shamanism, I touched on that. I won't get into it now. That'll take too long. The Beatitudes. Not that I know anything about them, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. Someday, when I'm stuck, I'll talk about that. And when I finally have given up caring about people thinking I'm a Holy Joe, I don't see myself as a Holy Joe. I find these things interesting. The attitudes, it's like the New Testament equivalent of the Ten Commandments. They're actually both pretty good suggestions for living. But yeah, thou shalt not. We don't really want to hear that nowadays. I don't want to hear it. But, and as we know, these things can be used to control people. But yeah, Nick Cave talked about that, about sort of God being the, you know, domineering father and then Jesus being the son who kind of took over. It's a bit more mellow. The attitudes. I don't, I don't have many Bible quotes in my head. Actually, one is from, I think, early in Matthew, I think. Um, look not to the morrow, for the morrow shall look after itself. And immediately as I say that, I can hear Christopher Hitchens' voice in my head saying that's a load of bollocks. It's funny he specifically honed in on that one. I think it's a great quote. Um, yeah. Like, it was put maybe in a more accessible way by the guy who sang that song, Don't Worry. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> of course, as soon as I say that, another voice says, come on, sing it. Nah. No. <laughs> someday, someday. I've got plenty of time. i got like, this is day four. I think i got up to 200 days of this. So save the good stuff for later, right? But yeah, you got, look not to the morrow, for the morrow should look after itself. You got to be, uh, the first would be last, the last would be first. 
They're interesting ideas because previous to that, they were quite alien ideas. Although, maybe the Buddhists came up with it as well. I'm not giving it all to Christ, but certainly society is still like, it's very much the first to be first and the last to be last. And I guess at a Darwinian level, maybe that makes sense. I don't know if it even at a Darwinian level does anymore though, because for society to function, we actually all do need to look after each other. I mean, the Darwinian thing, how well is that working out for us now with division of wealth? Not great, I think. And once again, I'm not getting into politics. Mainly because I am not well versed enough to talk about it. It's pretty obvious to me though that things can't continue as they are. But I also lived in former Soviet Union for a year and uh, that wasn't neoliberalism, but certainly, uh, well that was the end of communism and then this kind of crazy mafia capitalism is coming in overnight. It's pretty frightening, it really was. God, some of the things I saw there, it's really sad. So anyway, I'm not trying to make everybody sad. Hope, I hope somebody's listening to me right now, as in right now, assuming all time exists at once. Like even if all time does exist at once, if nobody actually listens to this, then that means right now nobody is listening to me. <laughs> I'm listening to me. I'm, I'm enjoying me, so that will do. And luckily we're getting near the end of my day four on the Camino, walking in BK Lee's footsteps from Orison to Callado de Le Poder, or however you pronounce that. Ultimately, his day one will end a month's advice, and Full Camino will end 800 kilometers later in Santiago de Compostela, and then he goes on to Finisterre, which a lot of people do on the coast. Looking forward to seeing that because I finished in Santiago. And I am in this for the long haul, so I am going to make it. Well, as I always say God willing, because we just, as we know, people who did the full Camino didn't always make it, and some, some of the monuments testify to that. Um, that's, that's life, that's how it goes. I'm trying not to get too morbid. I don't know, once you accept that it's not so bad though. Huh. Yeah, 59 minutes on my treadmill and on the video it says 58, okay I'll go for two more minutes. About to hit 4K on my treadmill, which is good. I probably won't, I think I'm just sticking at four kilometers an hour each day. I know I can clock up more kilometers by going faster, but I, uh, I think for the talking and thinking, this pace seems nice. Yeah, seems nice. I hope somebody is listening. Lots of people are listening. <laughs> I hope a million people are listening. That's that's not too greedy, is it? I hope this goes viral. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I hope I end up on all the chat shows talking about light entertainment chat shows as well as the deep ones. I like to do both. I'll tell a few funny stories. I'll do my Scottish accents. Okay, how we doing? BK, I'm going to be checking out, leaving you on your own. I have faith in you. Well, I know you make it to the end anyway. And uh, wish me luck as I continue in your footsteps, and indeed in my own footsteps, and indeed in the footsteps of the millions of people who have walked the Camino. God bless you all. 
and anybody who is listening to it with along with me. Um, oh, I just realized that tomorrow we will get to Ronson Valle, so it'll be the end of a full day for BK. Full, really tough day. Because basically that goes to five hours and eight minutes. I think he's got some maps and things at the end. We can have a look at those as well. So, I wonder will I go a couple more minutes now? No, I won't because I have nothing to say. Okay. Over and out. God bless Buen Camino. See you tomorrow. Whew. Fan off. Light off. And stop recording.